Well, I guess you could say a good jobs report is all in the eye of the beholder. And when it comes to President Trump's eyes, he is now beholding a excellent job report, whereas as a candidate, similar reports, he described them as being phony, as being a hoax. And I have a lot more sympathy for candidate Trump than President Trump, because now President Trump is trying to pretend that the jobs numbers that he used to be so critical of are now reflecting what a great job he's doing as president, when there's really no difference between this job report and the ones that we got under Obama, with probably one exception, and that is in the number that we got, which was a little bit better than Estimus, but not nearly as good as some people had hoped, given the very, very strong ADP number that we got earlier in the week, is because we did get a surge in manufacturing jobs. There was also a bump in construction jobs. But I am very suspicious of the manufacturing jobs because I know a lot of American manufacturers are really trying to curry favor with Donald Trump early in his presidency. And this could all be some Trump-related window dressing. I mean, this is a long trend of hemorrhaging manufacturing jobs. And I don't think this one blip necessarily means that the trend has changed. And so I wouldn't get too excited. I mean, it is a good thing to be creating goods producing jobs, manufacturing jobs. I'm not criticizing that. But the question is, is it sustainable? Is it real? Or is this simply some smoke and mirrors that has been orchestrated selectively to try to make Trump look better early on so that certain companies can get whatever they want from Donald Trump when it comes to a tax reform or any other kind of issues where uh, these companies may have a vested interest in a particular outcome. Let me just go over the actual number that came out. So we're talking about February non-farm payroll, and the consensus was about 200,000 jobs. 227,000 was the number created in January. So most of that was prior to Trump becoming president. Of course, it was subsequent to his, uh, his election. But we did 227,000 jobs in January, and they actually revised that up to 238,000 jobs. We did 235,000 in February, so actually slightly less, at least based on the initial estimate, of what the jobs that were created in the prior month. Unemployment rate did fall slightly from 4.8 to 4.7, and labor force participation inched up from 62.9 to 63 as more Americans re-entered the labor force. Average hourly earnings, though, which were expected to rise 0.3, they only rose 0.2, but they did revise the prior month from 0.1 to 0.2. So I guess that was about a push But 0.2 is not a lot of uh, increase in wages, especially when prices are rising at two to three times as fast. Remember, January, consumer prices are up six-tenths. So that's triple the rate that wages were up. And the average work week remained the same at 34.4. As I said, though, what was a little bit different this time was the complexion of the jobs. We did create jobs in manufacturing for a change, right? We had... um, 28,000 manufacturing jobs created. Uh, Construction also had a lot of job created. In fact, it was the number two category after health and uh, education. But again, I think these construction jobs are also kind of suspect because with mortgage rates continuing to rise, uh, with interest rates continuing to rise in general, in fact, I think we are on the verge of a uh, collapse in commercial real estate, particularly in... um, shopping center type uh, properties, you know, malls and, 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 and um, strip, strip centers. We are so over retailed in the United States. We have far too many uh, stores, especially now given the fact that so many people now shop online. But we have far more stores per capita than anywhere else in the world. And I think this is just the beginning of a bursting of that bubble. And this is going to be a perfect storm for the landlords, right? The pension funds, the insurance companies, whoever owns the property, because what's going to be happening is interest rates are going to be rising. Yields rose to new highs for the year. 
uh, this week. So interest rates are rising. If you own commercial real estate, you don't have a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. You've got a short-term mortgage, maybe three, five years uh, locked in rates or maybe just an adjustable rate. So the cost of servicing that debt is going to go up. At the same time, the rental income is going to go down because so many of your tenants are going out of business. You're not going to be collecting rent. You're going to have empty stores where you're going to collect no revenue, but the cost is going to be going up. And a lot of these commercial property prices are going to fall. They're going to fall as rates go up and as the rental returns go down. So that means there's going to be foreclosures. That means the banks are going to be in trouble. All of this is probably going to prompt the Fed to come to the rescue of the markets, despite the fact that there's now 100% probability that the Fed is going to raise interest rates next week. The more germane point is that the Fed is going to be reversing. It is going to be cutting rates, and it is going to be coming to the aid of uh, the economy as these bubbles deflate. Evidence of what I'm talking about can be shown in today's jobs report. Retail, which has been one of the number one job creators lost 26,000 jobs during the month. That is a big decline in, in retail trade. And I think this is more significant because this actually could be the beginning of a trend. I doubt the big jump in manufacturing jobs is going to reverse uh, the, the trend there. But I do believe that this could be the beginning of a new trend as we hemorrhage retail jobs. Remember, so many of these jobs were created uh, during the Obama bubble. And of course, a lot of them are part time. And one of the reasons that so many are part time is because of that requirement that you provide your full time employees with health care. So to the extent that we do repeal Obamacare and we repeal that requirement, well, a lot of those part time jobs are going to disappear. Maybe there'll be more full time people, but then the net number of jobs uh, will decline. I think that's also going to happen in leisure and hospitality. We still created jobs there, but a lot of those jobs are in restaurants, and a lot of these jobs are going to be lost as well, because just like Americans can't afford to go shopping, they can't afford to eat out either. Meanwhile, the minimum wages are continuing to rise across the country, and of course, the real death knell for these uh, retailers would be if we actually did impose the border-adjusted tax forcing retailers to raise prices by 25 percent. The idea that they're not going to have to do that because customers are going to be insulated by a 25 percent surge in the dollar that's going to uh, negate the tax is complete nonsense. I don't even know how these economists can come up with these ridiculous theories. But to the extent that this border tax comes in, it's going to kill these uh, these retailers. That's why they're so against it. Look at the, the full court press by Walmart and all the big box stores. They are spending a tremendous amount of money lobbying Congress to make sure that this border tax doesn't come through. But if it does, it's just going to make a bad situation much worse uh, for the retailers and, of course, for all the people that depend on retailing uh, for their employment. Now, other than Donald Trump's reaction and how his administration so quickly embraced the numbers that only recently they considered to be phony and a hoax, was the market reaction to these numbers. Because, of course, a stronger than expected jobs number or strong job number, the conventional wisdom, which, of course, is wrong, is, oh, this is going to be good for the dollar. And the dollar should go up on that number. Instead, the dollar index went down. In fact, the dollar index closed the week lower. It wasn't dramatically lower, but considering that the probability of a rate hike rose to 100 percent and that we got stronger than expected job creation, the fact that the dollar did not rise in the face of what most people consider bullish news for the dollar is more of a sign that the dollar is topping out and all of this talk about how the dollar is going to keep strengthening is wrong. Now, of course, you could say, well, maybe it's just to buy the rumor, sell the fact, but you know what? The fact is the rate hike. We haven't even had the rate hike yet. The fact that people are selling before the fact indicates that the dollar is even weaker than most people believe because people are, are, can't even wait for the news to sell. They're selling prior to the news. The same thing happened in gold. Gold was lower this morning or Friday morning when the numbers came out. But by the end of the day, gold had recovered. It rallied about 10 bucks off the lows to close up, I think, 3 or $4 back above 1200 and gold stocks, remember I talked about this on, on my last podcast, or not my last one, my one before that, about how I was noticing now all of a sudden that gold stocks were not that weak, that as gold continued to fall, gold stocks 
really looked like they were putting in a bottom. And since the gold uh, market, the gold stock market called the sell off, I said maybe it's also going to call the bottom and call a reversal. And the gold stocks stopped going down before the price of gold stopped going down. The price of gold fell for several more days as the price of gold stocks bottomed out. That's the reverse of what happened before the correction where gold stocks started to go down even as gold itself continued to rally. So gold stocks were early to call the gold decline. I think they're also early to call the new gold rise. I think the decline is over. I think we found a lot of support below 1,200. Gold stocks were much stronger on the day. In fact, the GDX was up about 2.8%. The GDXJ, which junior miners, was up over 5%. And there were many individual gold stocks that I noticed that were up 5 to 10% on the day. So you had a lot of strength, even though you just had a very, very small move up in the price of gold, right? Two or $3 is not a big move, but there was a much bigger move in the gold stocks. Also, I think hurting the dollar was a report that came out Friday regarding the ECB that they are considering raising interest rates, doing their first rate hike before they end their quantitative easing program. And I think that there's a very good chance that there's truth to that rumor. As a matter of fact, I think they're going to end up bringing to a early conclusion their QE program. In fact, Mario Draghi had a press conference earlier in the week. The ECB decided, as expected, to leave rates unchanged, and they didn't make any changes to their QE program. They're going to reduce it. I think it's, what, 80 billion euros a month. It's going to be reduced to 60 billion euros, which was something that they had told the market some time ago. But it's going to continue through the rest of the year or, you know, as long as necessary, according to Mario Draghi. But during the press conference, there were some reporters that asked him about inflation. And, of course, Mario Draghi continues to talk about inflation as if it's not there. He's still talking about how they're hoping to you know, achieve their mandate of inflation being close to but under 2%, that they still have work to do, that inflation is still too low. And when people point out, but wait a minute, inflation is already at you know, just below 2%, uh, Draghi's response is, well, those are transitory effects. This is food and energy. We've got to look at the core, and you know, the core is only about 1%. So according to Draghi, the, the ECB still has a lot of work to do. Because the core is only 1%. You know, it reminded me, remember of Baghdad, Bob, or the, the Iraqi information a minister who was saying, you know, everything is great. You know, there's no American tanks in Baghdad. Meanwhile, there's tanks all over the place. And he's standing there saying there's no tanks. And that's kind of the what I thought of when I was listening to Mario Draghi. I mean, he's talking about how there's no inflation when there's inflation all over the place. And so it's the same thing as saying there's no tanks when you're surrounded by tanks. But he doesn't want to acknowledge the inflation problem. As far as he's concerned, the problem is there's not enough inflation. Well, what is going to happen when it turns out that these price increases are not transitory? What's going to happen when the core rate of inflation gets to 2% and by then the actual headline rate of inflation is at 3%. I mean, what are they going to do? How is the ECB going to have to slam on the brakes? How are they going to have to start unwinding the balance sheet? Of course, they're going to have to do it. They are going to get pressure from the Bundesbank to do it. And I actually think as difficult as it's going to be for the European Union to reverse course, it's going to be impossible for America to do it. So we're going to be grappling with the same problem. We're going to have higher inflation, except we're not going to do anything about it. I think the Fed is going to accelerate its QE program, even as inflation is rising. Now, maybe, maybe rising inflation will prevent the Fed from going back to zero on rates, right? But they're going to have to do QE4. But believe me, even if they just keep rates unchanged, if they just stop raising them, even if they don't cut them, if inflation is accelerating, if inflation is going to 4%, 5%, 6%, and the Fed's still there at a half a percent, three quarters of a percent, real interest rates will be much lower than they were when the Fed was at zero to uh, 25 basis points because the actual rate of inflation will be significantly higher then than it was earlier. But regardless... The Fed is going to be doing quantitative easing because U.S. budget deficits 
are going to be absolutely massive. They're going to be huge. They're going to be big league under Donald Trump working with a Republican Congress and some Democrats to form a coalition, right? Donald Trump is going to be able to broker a deal between the Republicans and the Democrats, but any broker deal is just going to mean bigger deficits. It's going to have tax cuts that the Republicans like. It's going to have increased government spending that the Democrats like. In fact, even the Republicans like increased government spending as long as it's on the military or as long as it's on infrastructure, right? Even the Republicans now are in favor of going into debt to spend more money on infrastructure. So we're going to get that stuff and we're going to have a much bigger deficit. And who is going to finance it? You know, I did... uh, CNBC, I was on Fast Money again on Friday afternoon. And before I came on, you know, they were all talking about how strong the economy was. And, you know, they looked at the big drop in in oil prices. You know, oil now has fallen for about $54 a barrel, uh, back below, I mean, $49 a barrel. And nobody, it didn't dawn on anybody that the reason for this is a decrease in demand. That's what's going on. You have a decline in demand because the U.S. economy is weak. Look at the numbers that came out uh, from the budget. I mean, all of the, 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 the indicators show an economy that is weak. We're getting a lot of indicators that we don't see unless we're in a recession. The indicators that are strong are those that are based on optimism, on hope. And yes, there are a lot of people in America, particularly Republicans, who are feeling far more optimistic now about the future than they have been in a long time because they see some hope for change with Donald Trump. But what's actually happening, the real hard data shows a softening economy, even as people are hopeful that things are going to turn around. But they're not going to turn around, not anytime soon. And they can't turn around until we repair the damage and repairing the damage means that we have to let the bubbles deflate. We have to let the markets go down. We have to shrink government. We have to do all the things that we're not actually talking about because nobody wants to ruffle any political feathers. Nobody wants to take away any freebies uh, from the American public. You know, that is the problem with the repeal and replace when it comes to Obamacare. You know, I just wrote a article. Read the article I wrote. I mean, a lot of Uh, What I discussed on my podcast, my last podcast, is summarized in the article I wrote, Trump Care, um, Different Plans, Same Problem. It's up on uh, my website, on Europe Pacific Capital, on Shift Radio. So give it a read. But, you know, a couple of things I didn't even get into when I discussed the flaws in my, my last podcast. I mean, first of all, if this plan were passed, the incentive for large corporations is to completely drop health care coverage for all their employees and just self-insure. I mean, it's so much cheaper. It would be so much cheaper, of course, until the insurance companies went out of business. But let's say you're a large company. Maybe you got a thousand employees. Right. Why buy insurance for every one of those people? Because most of the people won't actually need it. Right. You have the insurance just in case something goes wrong. Right. Although a lot of people now use their insurance as a way just to pay for their routine medical care, which should not be the case and is only the case because of government tax code. But nonetheless, if a uh, large corporation just decided to drop the insurance completely and self-insure, right, it can set up a, a program for its employees where they can have some co-pays, right, they can have some deductibles and they can go to the doctor and, and pay for routine care up to a certain point and then have the company uh, pay, you know, a difference, you know, instead of buying expensive health insurance. And then when some of the people get really sick, obviously, if you have a thousand employees, somebody might get cancer, somebody might get into a car accident, right? Somebody might actually need a lot more than just, you know, routine checkups or maybe they sprain their ankle, right? Or something like that. The minute a company is faced with a large medical expense on the part of an employee, well, then they would just go buy outside insurance. No problem, because it only costs 30% more than what it would have cost if you insured him when he was still healthy. And so assuming that, let's say, you have 1,000 employees and maybe 5% of them get sick enough to actually have claims that would be more expensive than what the insurance might have been, well, then you go buy the insurance. So if you pay 30% more for the 5% of your workers that actually need it, but you pay nothing for the 95% that don't need it, 
I mean, it's a much better deal. So obviously, this is what's going to happen, right? But it can't happen because now the insurance companies are going to be deprived of all this revenue. Now, of course, if there's no coverage at all from the employer, and I guess I don't know if a self-insured uh, situation would count as employer-provided health care, but I mentioned on my last podcast, if the individual buys it on his own, then he can get the subsidy. But, you know, people forget whenever the government is giving away free money, right, any kind of government program, it's going to be exploited. It's going to be abused, right? Think about uh, welfare and food stamps and disability, even that crazy cell phone uh, gimmick. I mean, everybody games the system. That's just what happens. I mean, Trump care would be no different. I mean, imagine what's going to happen if the government is giving out $14,000 to a family of maximum, if they, you know, for their health insurance, people are going to just falsify. They're going to make up uh, dependents they don't have, just like they do for food stamps and, and things like that. I mean, people are going to commit fraud. There's going to be a lot of insurance companies that will be involved in the fraud, just like you have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, government uh, schools or housing projects that, that game the system and put in all kinds of false claims and, and collect all kinds of money. I mean, this is going to be a bonanza for fraud. I mean, people can go and buy, you know, BS insurance uh, products that are very cheap because they deliver very little actual insurance, very high deductibles. They have low maximum is what they would pay out. The goal would simply be to qualify for an insurance plan so that you can get the government tax credit. So if you can buy the insurance, you know, if a family can get all its phony insurance for $3,000 and then get a $14,000 tax credit, advanceable tax credit, they, they pocket nine grand. Right. If they actually need real insurance, if they actually get sick, well, then they can buy it later. That was my whole point, because it's only going to cost them 30 percent more. And in fact, even if they have lousy coverage, but it still counts as coverage, then they may not even have to pay the 30 percent premium. They might just be able to buy it at a normal premium because they wouldn't have had a lapse in coverage. They just would have had bad coverage. And as soon as they actually needed it, well, now I want to buy better coverage and you can't charge me any more because you can't discriminate based on pre-existing conditions. And, you know, the whole idea, too, that the government is going to somehow help contain costs by giving people money to buy health insurance, right? There is no real evidence of this working. In fact, in other areas where the government gives consumers money to buy something, like education, right? The government gives people money to go buy a college degree. They have grants, right, for people. They have government scholarships, government loans, right? We're giving students money. Are they shopping uh, for their college wisely with government money? Are, you know, no. College tuition is skyrocketing. And what happens is the government has to keep giving students more and more money so they can keep paying higher and higher prices for college. The same thing might happen with health care. Government gives you money to buy health care, and so health care gets more expensive. And now you got to get even more money from the government so you can buy even more expensive health insurance. Right? They keep raising the price because the government keeps giving you more money. People spend their own money, their own hard-earned money. That's where you get the, uh, the frugality. That's where people are concerned. People are always more concerned when they're spending their money than when they're spending other people's money. But the, the real problem here is democracy. I mean, that's the bottom line, because all over the world, we don't have a free market in health care, right? Because, you know, nobody wants to pay for health care, right? Nobody wants a doctor's bill, right? Nobody wants to go to the doctor. Everybody wants to be healthy. But everybody is worried. What happens if something goes wrong? What happens if I get sick, right? You know, can I afford it? So this is a right political issue to promise something for nothing, to promise people, hey, don't worry, because if you get sick, it's not going to cost you a lot of money. The government will take care of you. So you don't have to set money aside for a rainy day because we're going to make sure it never rains. Or if it does, we're going to protect you with this big government umbrella. And so the people fall for this. They don't understand economics. Right? The, the truth is that the best way to deliver low cost, high quality health care is for the free market to do it. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen. So we don't have any real comparisons because all these countries have this single payer or socialist type medicine. And then we compare it to America, which is not even close to a free market. And because this, this monster that the government has created, which is not free nor completely socialized, 
actually in some cases works so badly that it actually makes the socialized medicine, the single payer, look good by comparison. But if we actually had a free market like America used to have before the government screwed it up, it would be obvious what works. You know, I said you keep having all these politicians try to make excuses as to why health insurance or health care is so expensive now, right? Because it's so much better, right? We have all kinds of drugs that we didn't have before. We have all kinds of procedures that we didn't have before. But the truth is, those drugs, those procedures should have made health care costs lower. I mean, that's the point of it. I mean, now you can have a drug. You could take some medicine that will cure you. When in the past, maybe in the 1950s, when that medicine didn't exist, you needed surgery. You did, that, that was more expensive. And a lot of the procedures that we have now and a lot of the computers and the diagnostic equipment that we have now, doctors can figure out quicker what's wrong with you and they can, they can, they can fix it. Whereas before all this diagnostic equipment existed, it was much harder to figure out what was wrong. Right? You had to do a lot more things. So all this technology should have made healthcare cheaper. The reason it didn't make it cheaper is because of government. Because, right? you know, you can make the same argument, you know, if government was controlling the computer industry with all kinds of subsidies, just like they do healthcare, and computer prices were going up every year, they would say the same nonsense. Well, you know, they're so much faster. They can do so much more. That's why they're so much more expensive, because they're so much better, right? They would say the same thing, but they're getting better and they're getting cheaper at the same time. That's what the free market does. That's what the free market would do for health care if we gave it a chance. That's what it would do for education, right? It's not a coincidence that everything the government gets its hands on, it ruins. Why is college so expensive? It should be cheaper than it was, you know, in the 1950s. I mean, I don't know the exact statistics. Maybe it was like one in 10 uh, high school grads used to go to college, right? Now it's much higher. I don't know, 50%, 60%, 70%. I mean, you know, some high schools, 90% plus of the grads go to college, right? You have so many more people going to college today than we had back in the 1950s. Well, then why isn't it cheaper? There's something called economies of scale, right? If you're educating more people, the cost per person should be coming down, right? Because you get to amortize that cost over a larger uh, number of students. So the price per student should be coming down, but also technology. I mean, imagine back then, you know, when schools had to be done all with, you know, file cabinets and manila folders and index cards. I mean, you had to show up and they had to register you. They had to keep track of everything by hand. I mean, what about even before they had uh, photocopy machines? Everything was just done on carbon paper. Then what did they do before they had carbon paper? I mean, how they have copies of anything? I mean, everything had to be done by hand. Everything took forever. What about the, the exams? I mean, the professors, they had to grade the exams by hand. They had to read everything. Now you got a Scantron. You put the, 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 the test in a machine and the grades just pop out, right? People have all these computers to keep track of all the students. You know, and what about, you know, before they had to have these huge libraries full of books. Now you just have the internet. People can get all the books on their smartphone. They can read whatever they want. I mean, all of this, all of the technology should have made education substantially cheaper, but it didn't. Why didn't it do it? Because the government is involved. But again, this is where they're able to get go votes. They pander to it, right? Oh, we need more education. We need better education. Your kids need to be educated. And, and, and people vote for this nonsense because it sounds good. And nobody is willing to step up and, and oppose it. Same thing with health care. That is why the Republicans have such a difficult time actually repealing Obamacare and replacing it with nothing. In fact, not only repealing Obamacare, but repealing all of the other vote getting gimmicks that have been passed over the years to try to curry favor and win votes by promising people something for nothing that have backfired and have actually made health care less accessible and more expensive for the very people that these programs were supposed to help. But nobody has the time to try to educate the American public, which has already been dumbed down so much. You know, I keep hearing people talk about, oh, the American people are so smart. They're smart enough. They're going to see through some of these gimmicks. The American public are idiots. That's the only reason that we had Obamacare. That's the only reason that we have a replacement bill. It's because the American public is too dumb to realize 
that they would be better off without these bills. I mean, who is it? It was um, it was a P.T. Barnum that said you don't go broke overestimating the intelligence of the American public because it's impossible. I right? guess whatever you estimated at, it's actually lower. Like we like to pretend we're so smart, but we're not. You know, I think that where people are smart is just in in making their own decisions when it affects their own pocketbook. I think people can shop around for a good deal when they're spending their own money, right? So when people are making decisions that immediately impact themselves just based on the, you know their own spending patterns, there I think they should be left alone. But where they don't make a smart decision is when they're voting for politicians, right, to spend other people's money. Then the whole thing falls apart, which is which is the inherent flaw in the democratic process, which is why all these democracies are having so much trouble. It's why they're all broke. It's why the founding fathers said the average life of democracy is 200 years, because eventually uh, the the public votes itself bankrupt. They, they can't resist the temptation to, uh, to loot. And so they just eventually collapse. Final, uh, final comment, Bitcoin. You know, I had been talking about Bitcoin Recently, I did that debate with uh, Brian Kelly on, uh, on, on CNBC about Bitcoin. And one of the reasons that Bitcoin prices have been moving up was been the anticipation of the Bitcoin ETF, right, that the Winklevoss twins were hoping to launch. And then I think there were a couple more waiting in the wings. If this one got passed, maybe a couple more ETFs. And I, I said before in my last podcast that it makes no sense to have a Bitcoin ETF. I mean, even the people that want to talk about you know, how great Bitcoin is because it's decentralized. There's no counterparty risk. I mean, all that goes away the minute you have your Bitcoins in an ETF. I mean, now all of a sudden you have counterparty risk, right? Because now you have a third party holding it. And in fact, the ETF is going to charge storage fees. Why pay storage fees on your Bitcoin when you can store them yourself for nothing? Uh, so it doesn't even make sense. It just made sense to me as a speculative vehicle, as a way for maybe the Winklevoss to unload a bunch of their uh, Bitcoins into this ETF. And I think the uh, the regulators saw through this. They saw this really as a gimmick, and it was a very high risk venture. And they just didn't want the investing public uh, to take any part of it. I mean, if people want to buy Bitcoin, there's nothing stopping them from doing it. Just go open up an account and buy them. And of course, you know, if you have your Bitcoin in a uh, in an ETF, you can't even use it in commerce. If it's going to be a replacement, if it's going to be a currency, why do you want to lock up your currency uh, in in an ETF? I mean, the ETF was just a, a speculative vehicle for a speculative vehicle. Anyway, just after the close on Friday, they announced the decision. Now, Bitcoin had been rallying earlier in the morning. In fact, Bitcoin prices got as high, I think, as 1325 or 1350. I forget exactly where it hit, but it was an all time record high and it was earlier in the morning. And then, you know, it had come down uh, a bit. By the time the decision came out, I think it came back down to about 1250. So it spiked up, you know, and then and then and then lost a lot of the spike, but it was still kind of up on the day. And then as soon as the news came out, the price immediately collapsed. The low I saw was 975. So from 1350 to 975, that's about a 40 percent range in one single trading day. Remember when I did that debate? Uh, with Brian Kelly on CNBC, the guy actually said that Bitcoin is less volatile than gold. In fact, what do you mean less volatile? I mean, you can you can you can uh, tout Bitcoin all you want, but you don't lie about it. Don't pretend that it doesn't have volatility when it does. I mean, gold doesn't move by forty percent between the high and the low in an individual trading day. This was a huge move, and of course, after it collapsed, it rallied back up, and not all the way back up into the thirteen hundreds. In fact, as I'm recording this. It's back, you know, 1196. I'm looking at it right now. I mean, gold closed at 1203. So it's right back around, you know, parity. Not that it means anything with the price of gold. But the bottom line is this is a highly um, speculative asset that swings in price wildly based on people betting on its on its future price. So, you know, even if it could ever be a, a currency, obviously it can't be now, not with that kind of crazy volatility. But to be honest, I mean, at least the, at least the, the price hung in there because I think there was a lot of speculation that it would be approved, even though at best it was a coin toss. But it just shows you that the people willing to bet on approval uh, were willing to pay up for those bets uh, because if it was a 50-50 shot, you know, 
it really shouldn't have gone up that much unless you believed that the upside from the approval was much higher than the downside uh, for the non-approval. But meanwhile, it looks like now that Bitcoin is back in a trading range. Uh, but, you know, we'll see. I look like a thousand would have been support for the currency just basing on the chart. So I guess as long as it can hold above that level, uh, maybe it's uh, it, it has some more upside. But I think if it breaks down below that, you know, 750 or so, it can get back down there. And of course, if it breaks that, and eventually it's going to break all this support because all this support is eventually going to give way when reality sets in and the currency is going to come crashing down. Can it make new highs? Can Bitcoin uh, go higher before it comes crashing down? Of course. Of course it can. Nobody knows, but it's a gamble. That's all it is. It's a gamble. On the other hand, gold, I'm 100% confident that gold's going up. Over time, the longer you hold your gold, the more it's going to be valuable, the more valuable it's going to be. Can it go down during the period of time between the time you buy it, and the time you sell it or use it in commerce? Of course, it can go down before it goes up, but it's going to go up. Bitcoin could go up before it goes down, but ultimately you don't want to get caught holding those coins right when the music stops. <music> Today's financial advisors behave like pro wrestling TV commentators. They scream that the recovery is strong, debt is manageable, inflation is low, and that the Federal Reserve has everything under control. They may be oblivious, but the danger is real. Looking beyond the media hype can open a world of broader investing ideas. Euro Pacific Capital is a registered investment advisor that offers stock-focused wealth management services that closely follow the strategy of our founder and CEO, Peter Schiff. We concentrate on those countries that are more closely in tune with Peter's vision of how capitalism is supposed to work. And these investments are not hard to find, provided you know where to look. Isn't it time you change the channel and let Euro Pacific put a little reality back into your portfolio? If you live in the United States and have $25,000 or more to invest, call 800-727-7922. That's 800-727-7922. Non-U.S. residents access similar strategies through Euro-Pacific Bank at europacbank.com. Euro-Pacific Capital and Euro-Pacific Bank are affiliated companies. Hi, this is Peter Schiff, and long before foreign governments were buying gold, I urged my clients to put 5 to 10% of their portfolios into physical precious metals. Despite gold's massive rise over the last decade, I still think that a 5 to 10% allocation to gold and silver is a smart investment decision. But buyers have to beware. Big TV gold dealers push all sorts of coins that are poor investments. Bait and switch deals, price protection guarantees, leveraged gold accounts. These are just a few of the sleazy tactics used to swindle inexperienced gold buyers. My gold company is different. We never offer a coin or bar unless I consider it to be a good investment. I want my customers to be educated. That's why I'm offering you a free research report exposing the biggest scams and ripoffs in the industry. Download my report, Classic Gold Scams and How to Avoid Getting Ripped Off for Free at goldscams.com. This report tells you everything you need to know about how to avoid losing thousands of dollars with scam gold dealers. It even tells you how to tell if a salesman is lying to you on the phone. This is a must read for anyone considering a gold or silver investment. Download this free report today at goldscams.com. That's goldscams.com.